We have uh, okay. We have two speakers for the next uh, slot. So this is the last part of the day. Uh, so it's Jan and uh, and Bars, uh, and they're coming from Basel, so from the other side of Switzerland. And I mean, also, also close to France. Yeah, uh, close to yeah. France, and yeah, exactly. They are in the same situation. Yeah. As <laughs> and you will be talking about uh, Ansible, uh, yeah. some fr some uh, f yeah, the yeah. Ans framework, exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Please. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, I'd like to do a, a show of hands who I think most of us are familiar with uh, configuration management tools, but who uh, in this room used or, uh, uh, or uses currently Ansible for, for some form of uh, uh, nice. And uh, who um, manages uh, client machines as well, like Linux, Linux desktop or laptop clients? So, that's not that many, but maybe after the presentation there will be a couple more who are interested in it. So um, first, first disappointment, ANS has nothing to do with, the, uh, with Java. It is just a name we picked for a, a wrapper. We wrote around Ansible to, uh, to use it uh, for our use case. And uh, we're going to, to tell you the story of like, how, we, how we got to, to where we are now and why we um, made the decisions we, uh, we made. So uh, very short introdu uh, introduction. Um, I am uh, Bal Sashwand and I'm a uh, system specialist. I do mainly macOS uh, clients uh, at the University of Basel. And uh, Jan, maybe give him a wave, exactly. He's, uh, he, he does, uh, he's system engineer mostly on the, on the Linux side and he's also our client security responsible. So if, if uh, somebody has something fishy, they, they run to, to him immediately. And the, the third, third person in our team, Michael Hussar, he couldn't make it uh, today uh, because he's also the uh, deputy team leader uh, client services, so he has other, other responsibilities as well, but he uh, sends his, his regards. The agenda for today will be a, a short introduction of, uh, of our situation, because I think it's important to, to understand uh, our, our setup or the way the university is organized to understand why we made certain decisions this way and not another. Uh, then we'll talk about configuration management and what we, uh, what we take away from it. Then the, the main uh, attraction, the, the wrapper around Ansible, um, uh, then a short uh, roundup, and maybe we have time for questions, we'll, we'll see. So without further ado, the University of Basel, where we work, is uh, quite an old one. It was founded in 1460. Uh, it has uh, around 5,600 employees, 4,000 scientists, 1,000 administrative staff, and a little short of 13,000 uh, students. Uh, it's divided into seven faculties, 29 departments, and uh, it's spread out uh, in the city on 90 sites. This is, the, this is an important part for us because it means we're not organized in a uh, traditional campus environment where, where everything is, uh, where it's easier to standardize things. And this is also reflected in our organizational uh, structure. We are part of the central IT service provider. We are uh, working for the client services department uh, where we provide uh, frameworks to, to manage client machines. And uh, we also provide third level support for, for our tools, of course, but uh, also for the, for the OSs themselves. And uh, you remember, 90 sites. So um, we have uh, currently five, uh, five different sites. Um, which are located closer to the end user, and these are the ones that are actually uh, touching the, the end user's machine, they are touching the, the clients, and they use the frameworks we provide to, uh, to support these people to manage these machines, and they also provide first and second level support. And uh, this, this is in important when we come to the configuration management part, and especially to the requirements we have towards um, configuration management based on our environment. We provide the framework, but we are not the ones actually administering the, the machines. And in fact, we know very little about the machines. We know the, the host name and the MAC address, and that's about it. But we, um, for people who work in academia, they um, might be familiar with that. Uh, it's difficult to uh, agree on a university-wide naming scheme. So uh, just because a machine is named a certain way, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't tell us that much necessarily. So, um, yeah, we provide the framework, but these uh, five different sites, they're the ones who are actually providing the service to the end user. Uh, 
they are not just administering Unix, uh, Linux machines, they are also administering Mac and uh, Windows, and uh, most of them are quite uh, Windows heavy. So in order for them to, to use our framework, we don't want them to have yet another um, yet another interface for, well, if you administer Windows machines, you have this tool, if you administer uh, Mac, you have this, and then uh, a third one for, for Linux. We want it, uh, the interfaces to be intuitive for them and uh, preferably something they, uh, they already knew. Uh, delegation. We're not touching the machines. I iterate again and again on that point. So we need to be able to uh, give uh, the site administrators the tools to do the management themselves. I don't want to get a ticket or a call every time a machine changes role or a uh, configuration has to change on one machine. So we need tools to, to delegate this host configuration ma mapping to the uh, site administrator. It's also more rewarding because then they can actually do something when a user comes to them and they are not just the ones who, opening ticket, who are opening tickets with us. Uh, they also have to, to test these changes because uh, depending on their setup, they might have uh, research groups who have a more complicated setup, research groups who are probably more standardized, but this is information that, is, uh, that they know they, uh, that uh, we don't necessarily know. As I said before, we know very little about the machines. We have more and more laptops, they roam networks, so we don't know when the machine will be reachable in which network. We don't know necessarily with what IP they will, they will show up. So that is something we have to consider. And uh, because Apple has the tendency to when a new OS is released, the new hardware will ship, with that OS we have to provide zero day support for, uh, for these releases as well. Uh, then. We had some requirements for, for us as well. We said, well, if we're going to put in the work to, to do configuration management, we want to get something out of it as well. And the first thing, uh, I think everybody in this room loves uh, everything Git. We want to version everything. We want to be able to, five years from now, go back and say, well, this line of code or this line of configuration was changed by this person, and the reason for it is in a, a very extensive Git message, well, at least. Maybe something more, more than just updated configuration. So, um, yeah, but that is, that is a start. The second, we want to curate the configurations we provide. And you might probably have guessed, if you have five different sites, you have different levels of skill as well. You have people there who are very, who have the resources to be full-time Linux administrators. They, they, work, they work great in that environment, but you also have the people who are doing mostly Windows management and they do some bash scripting on the site. And to expect the same level of quality from somebody who's writing most of their time, spends most of their time writing uh, PowerShell uh, in a bash script is, is, not, uh, is not fair. So what we wanted to do is centralize this information, like take the, the best that was provided from the, from the site administrators and offer this to the, the other ones who were probably not as fluent in, uh, in these OSs. Uh, we also, we're lazy. We don't want to uh, care for additional infrastructure. So if we can do with less, we, we will, because that will save us resources and energy in the, in the long time, in the life cycle. We also wanted a clear development, testing, and production workflow for the configuration management. And uh, that is always a, a difficult one, but we've been burned in the past uh, to uh, have invested heavily in tools where we couldn't get stuff out. So that was something we wanted to be cautious about, to say, well, we're, we're, using, we're using a tool. Uh, we will have an, a technical investment in this tool, but we want to be clear at which point we can get information out of it and where it's like totally in there and we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot get it out anymore. We also wanted to, to keep it simple. We wanted to have a modular design. So we wanted to have a tool that does configuration and configuration only. And uh, we wanted to adhere to the infrastructure as code concept. I think that is something that most of you are familiar with. But just to reiterate, the idea behind it is that you have machine-readable files that define the, the state of your, of your uh, environment, of your infrastructure. And these files, they are declarative. So they will tell you, for example, how the state of, a, of a configuration of a web server should look like, but not necessarily how to get there. If you, if you use 
any of the configuration management tools currently available, uh, Ansible, Chef Puppet, or, or the like, you will be familiar with that. You have your definitions file, but you don't give it a step-by-step a step by step instruction of how to get there. That is something the tool should do for you. So we had a look around with all these requirements in mind to see what components were already available for us. And we actually have a, a tool that has a modular graphical user interface already, which most of our um, administrators are already, in, um, are already familiar with and uh, which has a strong support for permissions delegation. I said we are uh, rather Windows heavy, can you guess? Mm. Hey, Microsoft Active Directory. Um, they, know, they know how to use it, it is perfect for permissions delegation, so uh, we want to use that as well because we don't want to teach people to, how to use yet another tool. If they have one they, f they are familiar with, let's go ahead and use that. Uh, then we needed a place to store our configuration well, we have uh, already uh, available Git infrastructure, so we can, use, we can recycle this. And then we needed something for configuration management and uh, an agent on the client. Uh, we already used Ansible for our, our servers, so it was a logical step to look into, into this. And uh, lucky for us, Ansible supports pull mode, which solves uh, our problem quite nicely. So let's look at that. Let's look at the ANTS uh, framework. And the Ansible core concept, for those who need a uh, refresher on Ansible, the default way is the so-called push mode, or at least I call it push mode. It runs, it being Ansible, on a central host that is maybe your development machine or an Ansible tower or that like. Uh, it has Ansible installed, <coughs> that machine. It has uh, access to uh, an inventory source and also the, the configurations you want to have applied to, to your sites. Once you start your Ansible run, it will connect to each client over SSH and will do the configuration there. So far, so good. There are quite a few advantages to that approach. You don't need any software on the, on the host you want to configure. All you need is uh, SSH, and there you go. However, the uh, disadvantage for us is uh, you need to know how to, to reach your machines, and it doesn't work offline. So uh, in our case, that is, that is uh, quite difficult. But lucky for us, there's also, and this is the, hence the name of the uh, talk, but there's also a, an upside down way of running Ansible, the so-called pull mode. In this case, you have your clients, the machines you want to configure, running Ansible. So they need Ansible installed, they need to have an inventory, and they need the configuration. The advantage for us is there's no central infrastructure needed at that point. You just install Ansible and the aforementioned parts on the, on the hosts, and there you go. And you don't need to know how to reach the clients, and that can also work offline because you can just enforce settings no matter if you uh, update the configurations or not. The uh, disadvantage, however, is that you need uh, Ansible on the client, so you need a way to, to get there, and you need a way to decentrally manage your inventory. And, uh, and there are some features like Ansible Vault, which is basically a way to, to encrypt information and store it in Git, which you cannot uh, use on, uh, in this way of running. So now Jan will go through the individual components. <coughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. So Buds just mentioned the shortcomings of Ansible in pull mode, and our ANS framework is basically just a wrapper that tries to uh, overcome those shortcomings. So Ansible provides a neat way of um, using uh, inventory scripts. So normally you just have an inventory script in Ansible. It might be static, but you can also provide a, a script to it, and it will execute it happily. And if uh, JSON comes out in a group uh, <laughs> layout, it's happy. So you can have a programmatical way of uh, having infrastructure. So we uh, took advantage of this to write our own inventory source. It's implemented in Python because uh, all the operating systems that we support are already shipped with Python. Ansi uh, uh, Ansible is written in Python, so it was an easy choice for us. So what we are doing is we are querying Ag Microsoft Active Directory over LDAP, and we are getting the groups. Um, the operating system itself does not necessarily need to be bound to Active Directory because we can do the, the, all the LDAP magic in our scripts. 
and we just search for the fully qualified domain name of our host and we return its Active Directory groups as JSON. That's all the magic. Um, this is how such an output can look like. You see the groups, in our case the groups don't say something like web servers but they're more like configuration names and this has the advantage that the support staff can easily assign configuration by groups to clients. That way they can cherry pick our configurations and apply them to computers. And um, since we wrote the script ourselves, we can also uh, implement a caching uh, mechanism. So once we successfully queried all the groups from Active Directory, we just write them locally and the next time the machine is offline or in a foreign network where they can't reach our Active Directory, they just read the cache and uh, run Ansible with this cache. Um, and if the idea we had was, you know, you have some configuration rules that rely on internal network resources, like Active Directory, for example, and we just don't want to run them when we are in a foreign network or offline to keep the noise down. So we actually <laughs> have an artificial group here that we apply when we are online, and then the online configurations are only applied then, and we keep the noise low on our reporting. And um, this is a component of the ANTS framework that we um, published. Um, another, so the, how do you administrate the host to group mappings? And ben, ma, uh, Bals mentioned that um, our support staff are not native uh, Linux uh, graybeards. Most of them aren't. So um, they use Active Directory uh, groups and computers. Um, it's already available to us, so we don't have to maintain it. Uh, it's not just that we are lazy, but it's also uh, we can do other things at the same time. And the support staff is familiar with it. So they, they use it for group permissions, they use it for network share permissions and all the good stuff. So when they assign groups to computers, it's very easy for them. And the delegation of Act, uh, within Active Directory is actually quite nice. You can have uh, the whole hierarchy of your organization in those delegations. And you can have nested groups. That way, if you have, for example, a department called Biocentrum, which does biological research, you don't want to assign every computer in the Biocentrum to every configuration group, but you might have a Biocentrum uh, group and then you have nested groups uh, and you uh, show the organizational structure in those groups. And that can be done by your support staff because only they know their organization that they support. This is the state-of-the-art dark mode uh, GUI of it. Um, on the left you see a, a computer object. The computer object has three groups. Uh, the first one is an Ansible test group, the second one is the second Ansible test group, and the third one is uh, domain computers, it's a normal group. And those groups are mapped to our configurations, and you can easily use this GUI to add or remove configurations in our case. Um, the, the, one of the requirements was that everything is tracked in Git, and everything but what I just showed you is tracked in Git, so everything but the mappings, which computer should get which configuration, is tracked in Git. So the Ansible playbooks, the roles, the variables, and templates are all in Git. That means if somebody changes something, it's tracked. So it's by design, you can't go around it. Uh, we use three Git branches for our uh, setup. So we use a development Git branch where we do the naughty test stuff that isn't production ready yet, and then we push it to testing. But before we push it to testing, somebody has to request our pull request because our testing environment is already facing to some test users, and we don't want to offend them. We want them to be happy test users, otherwise we lose them. So here we have like a 4i concept, Two of our people have to uh, sign off this pull request and then it gets into testing. The same in production again. So only uh, approved pull requests are pushed in production and that way we can keep everybody happy by uh, uh, assuring the quality of it. Uh, the, the cool thing here is I mentioned that we can assign groups to computers and we also assign the branch groups to the computers. That means our support staff can decide what computer is a test computer and they can even do this on demand they can assign for one configuration they can put it to a, or one test configuration they can apply to a certain computer and take it away later and then it becomes productive again 
All right. I think the best configuration management is useless without reporting, so we take care of that too. Um, first of all, we are doing the same stuff that Ansible already does. We are logging into local files, rocket science. Um, it's just that we split the log files because most of our clients have around 100 configurations and some of them are skipped by default, so we don't want to go through all the noise. So, for example, we don't even show the skipped stuff. And we have like four uh, files, OK, changed, and failed. And you're usually interested in, in one of the three. Or if you're lazy, you just go into status and see everything is all right. <laughs> um, since recently, we log everything into our ELK stack. Everybody knowing what an ELK stack is? Nobody's saying anything. It's Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. It's a nice way to have a central uh, logging system. Um, we use that for our we are starting to use it for everything. Um, so our networking people are putting in their networking logs. We are starting to put in our client logs. We can have nice dashboards, which I will, I will show you some uh, in, a, in, a, in a second. And we can have historical data. So if we have certain problems only on Friday afternoons, we know it's only Friday afternoons and we can look at the problem. Maybe there's beer or something. Um, this is one of the dashboards of our test environment. You see you have uh, weekends, and there's actually new stuff that we can start to look at. This here is actually, um, yeah, you can't really see it, but this is the runtime of the playbooks. And uh, the statistic stuff is on the bottom. So everything is flat, but one host is uh, getting like crazy. It has like 9,000 second runtime. So we know something is fishy with this host. And this is something we couldn't do in the past. All right, now you've seen all the components. Let's, how do the com components interact with each other? So of course we have hosts. This is one host that we would like to configure and we would to like uh, to apply n configurations to this host. So first of all, we install the ANS framework. This is just uh, our wrapper script with the inventory and some dependencies. And we rely on our central Git server, which can be any Git server and uh, the Active Directory. So when we run it, uh, the dynamic inventory source queries Active Directory, gets the mappings, then Ansible pull is triggered and gets the Git configurations and applies them. It looks really easy here and I can tell you in reality it's as easy. Okay, the setup is equally uh, difficult so you can just, it's packaged, um, <laughs> if you've seen the earlier, um, you can just install the dependencies, git and pip. This is, in, again, rocket science. Um, and after that, we use pip to install the ANS client. And it's pulling uh, some dependencies, so it takes a little bit longer. I don't know about you, but uh, when we did the recording, I realized how often I actually mistype stuff on the terminal. So this, uh, this isn't the first take. <laughs> we're just not brave enough to, to be embarrassed on this stage. But now we're embarrassed by how long this installer takes. Uh, okay. How many often you run Ansible on your computers? Excuse me? How many often you run Ansible on your computers? Every 15 minutes. And we delay it with a random delay. It's not necessary, but um, the Windows guys are running GPOs and they run every 15 minutes and we, you know, we don't want to introduce new times, so we just replicate what's... what's the main computer Windows uh, The most computers are Windows, yes. Yeah, okay. And more questions at the end because now our installation is done, but thank you for the, for the uh, thing. So here is now the first ANS run. It's again a video. We are not brave enough. No, it actually works most. No, it works. Um, this is now we trigger ANS without any parameters, and it looks like a normal Ansible run. It actually gets the configuration from our um, publicly available Git repository. And since everybody likes ASCII art, the one policy we enable by default is actually a logon banner. So if you SSH into your system, you get this. Um, exactly, this is an example configuration, but you can push anything. Um, round up. So what are the concept limitations? Um, Bals already mentioned it, so you can't have secrets in, in your local Ansible uh, playbooks. 
So you have to work around that. You store your <laughs> secrets somewhere else. For example, in Active Directory, um, cab was tickets. Um, everybody who used Git before and checked in some binaries knows that this will rather get biggy and uh, big. So don't store binaries in your Git repositories. Uh, it looks uh, interesting in the first way, but if you do it, it's, it's a pain in the ass. So just when you deploy software, use common tools like RPM, but trigger them with, with your configuration management, for example. What have we learned? So we started to develop this three years ago, and for a couple of years it's now in production, and we have some lessons learned. Use what's available to you already. That way you don't have to uh, run stuff, but you also don't have to educate people to use this stuff, because when they're already used to it, they're happy to use your new tools, even that they are uh, actually haven't used them before, but the GUI is the same. Uh, use a modular setup, so at one point, if we decide Active Directory wasn't the greatest idea, we can go to any LDAP server or any other inventory source, for example. So this wouldn't be possible with a monolith, because traditionally everything is in one big uh, blob, and you can't get single components out of it if they don't fit your purpose anymore. Um, one thing we learned is don't try to customize the tools, because if you customize such a tool that has such a rapid release cycle, like Ansible, for example, you have to make sure that your changes work. So just use some glue around it. So we use like the stable interfaces. We use the command line arguments, which didn't change since we started. Some things in the configuration uh, changed, but this is normal. This is not a big hassle to keep up to date. And like um, I stressed before, use uh, well-established tools like the GUI. Um, the support guys will, will like you for that. Uh, infrastructure as code, most of you probably already use it on the servers, but it works on clients too. And uh, it's not shocking news, but we didn't invent this. Other people are using Puppet, Chef, or Salt on clients. Uh, we don't know about many other people who use Ansible on end-user devices, but we can tell you we are quite happy with it because it brings all the advantages that all the other uh, that that the stuff on the server promises to. And um, if you want certain components in your workflow, just make sure that they can't be avoided. So if you have if you want <laughs> your configurations to be in Git. Incorporate Git into your workflow in such a way that nobody can work around it because documentation and versioning is the first thing that gets forgotten when you are in stress. And of course, make your coworkers feel happy because when they are in the stress fixing computers uh, for clients that are, uh, <laughs> they didn't wait for problems, um, it's a stressful situation already. And if you can't provide them tools that they're familiar with, they will thank you a great deal. So we open sourced this uh, two years ago, I think, and we would encourage everybody to participate as a user or as a contributor, contributor if, you, if you would like to or if you feel to. It's all on GitHub. Um, all the components of the framework are uh, uh, open source, so it's the agent that's the wrapper around Ansible, the dynamic inventory script for Active Directory, some example configurations, and if you find that there's a, a better way to do the configurations, just uh, send us pull requests, and we will be happy to, to review them. And of course, like everybody uh, says, <laughs> we will have more configurations in the future um, if you don't see any pushers to, to, to release them. And um, I, we stressed earlier that we're recycling not old infrastructure, but state-of-the-art infrastructure from other teams, and this doesn't come for free. So we would uh, thank our colleagues. This is the first one is our uh, our closest team. It's our team, the client services, and the, the IT service centers. This is the support staff that uh, gave us great feedback and uh, ideas how to implement or how, what, what they need to be happy, and our management for not uh, forcing us to buy a monolith. And, of course, the rest of the <laughs> university IT. Um, we got some great feedback from the Ansible meetup in Zurich. If you're not afraid of, of German-speaking events, uh, please uh, come there and attend. And if you ask, they will switch to English. It's fine. Um, and, of course, the whole uh, open source community around Ansible and Python. Now I hope you have some questions or even better recommendations. Um, feel free to, to ask. Thank you. Uh, yeah.
So yes, we have time for a couple of questions, maybe. You made, thank you very much for the presentation. You made an intriguing comment for, uh, towards the end about support for other um, um, providers than Active Directory. Are there people using ants with, um, I don't know, free IPA, something no. else? Um, so the Active Directory connector is actually just an LDAP connector. We are taking, or it's, 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 we call it Active Directory connector because it does some uh, nesting groups magic, but we could easily change it to, to use any LDAP server like free IPA. If you are interested in it, uh, I can show you how to do it. There was another question there. Yes, I have two questions. First one, how you test your uh, new roles? So you have uh, com virtual machines, containers, so how you are sure that your changes work? Um, we have uh, several ways. We have in the, the command line utility, you can specify the branch. So if you want to run one of the development branches, you just tell it, uh, well, use this branch and there you go. And uh, also, um, that maybe got, got lost a little in the, in the presentation, but we have a, a local configuration file which specifies which branch your machine uh, uses by default. And that can be changed to these Active Directory groups as well. So if you add yourself to, a, to the testing group, then uh, the next time Ansible will run, it will still be production, but that will change to testing. And so two times afterwards, that will be, uh, you'll then always pull from testing. And so the, the um, site administrators, they can choose which machines they want to have in the, in the testing branch. And uh, they can say, and they usually, the, the changes are things they, they request themselves, so they know which users are most, um, like they have their power users who are willing to give feedback, and they will add them to the test group. Okay. One last question. Okay. Hey, thanks. It's really interesting. So we have something similar at CERN based on Puppet because we are a Puppet shop, right? Uh, and we don't use Git. We ship dependencies as RPMs because we trust. So this was my question. You, you put everything in Git. You have a trace for everything, but you use pip to install everything. Isn't that a bit dangerous? Don't you think uh, it would be better to have an RPM? Actually, or? if you check our documentation, we tell you this is uh, quite easy to use in your development machines. In production, we don't ship like this. Okay. We built an RPM okay. for the Linux machines, and Bart built a package for the Mac machines. So we have this under control. OK, excellent. Thanks. There was one more. One last quick question. Yeah, just a question, short question. Uh, it's uh, about uh, security guys. Uh, what's their opinion about uh, connecting, I mean, uh, doing all the LDAP queries uh, when a uh, laptop is not on, the, on your environment, I mean, on the university? So when we are only using LDAP-S, so it's encrypted? <laughs> but but what, what, your, what, what do you see? What yeah, but still you need uh, user and uh, password? Yes. So everything, it's, 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 it's fine, I mean, but it's, oh, still it's open, I mean, the, yeah. the, the Active Directory to the, to the worldwide. I yes. mean. But no, 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 no. The, no, the Active Directory is not open worldwide, that is just on the internal network, but we, uh, what we do is we cache the information we, we get, so the, like the, your, which configurations the machine is assigned to, that only gets updated if the machine is in the internal network. But that uh, very rarely changes. Like usually you have uh, a machine that is assigned a certain role and the configurations, they, they might change because the, the OS changes or we, we find some bugs and uh, it, there's no problem to open, to open Git up to uh, worldwide because you can then just SSH through it. And the only information you can get from the LDAP queries is which computer gets which configurations. So it's a risk we are taking. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you, and thank you for all the questions. <laughs>